basketball where St. John's basketball coach Mike Jarvis was fired today after this year's team got off to one of the worst starts in school history. Jarvis was in his sixth season with the Johnnies, compiling an overall record of 110 wins and 61 losses. He led St. John's to three NCAA tournament appearances, but this year has been marred by off the court problems and injuries as well. So after a two and four start, the university decided to pull the plug. It's always a surprise when it happens. So, so yeah. Um, but once you, you know, you you get over the the initial shock and you get your ego back to where it belongs, you know, you're you're ready to 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 move on. After an overall review of the program, uh, we came to the conclusion that it was in everybody's best interest uh, to make uh, a move now. Um, so we thank. Mike Jarvis for his service to the university and uh, we're looking forward to Kevin Clark leading us into the future. And Kevin Clark was Jarvis assistant. He now takes over on an interim basis. I'm Kevin Garrity battling a bit of a head cold. I might lose my voice at any moment so just kind of bear with me as I try to make it through the hour. Well first it was Brian Mahoney then Fran Fischilla now Mike Jarvis. No matter who St. John's brings in to coach their men's basketball team, it's hard to live up to the legend of Louie. After five plus years at the helm, Mike Jarvis was relieved of his duties today. He'll be replaced on an interim basis by assistant coach Kevin Clark. Jarvis took over the program in June of 98 after Fran Fraschilla was fired. He took that team to the final eight in the NCAA tournament and the following year St. John's captured the Big East Championship. Jarvis compiled a 110 and 61 record in his time at the commuter school. In recent years, the team started playing average basketball, although they did capture the NIT title last year. Jarvis also had some problems with players. The most recent was the dismissal of senior Willie Shaw, who was arrested for marijuana possession. St. John's began this season with a 1 and 4 record, including losses to Hofstra and Fairfield, and they just barely beat St. Francis, New York. Today, the administration felt it was time for a change. Jarvis, always a stand-up guy, faced the media in his office. I just know that it happened because um, St. John's decided it was time to uh, end our working relationship. How much will you miss this school? I'll miss a lot, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, I, 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 I feel good about the fact that I, I believe that we've left it better than we found it. Um, I believe that we've done a lot of good work here, not only in basketball, but in the community, uh, mainly through the efforts of my wife. We're going to continue to do that. Um, you know, I have no regrets. Mike and I had a meeting earlier today. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, we reflected on the past and talked about the future. Uh, but the important uh, thing was that we, we didn't say goodbye to each other because it's such a small industry. We talked about, we'll see you later, and wished each other well, and talked about the prospects for the future. Is it a good message? I, of course not. I don't think so. And I think that's probably what most of my colleagues would say, is that it's, a, it's out of a, a dangerous kind of a precedent. Um, one that was once reserved only for professionals. Um, but. We're in another, we're at another time, and we're in another place. I chose this profession, and that means that I've got to be ready to deal with uh, the rules of the game. The rules of the game change. The rules of our game are changing um, more and more than we probably realize, and more and more certainly than we like. You can give Jarvis credit on several fronts. Sure, he took a team chock full of Fran Fraschilla recruits back in 98-99, and took them to the final eight, but he had something right. He did something right to get that group to within one win of that final four. Then he followed that up with a Big East championship. And even though they played all five games at home en route to last year's NIT championship, they still did what they had to do to win that title. Mike Jarvis must have had something to do with that. But it was clearly time for a change at St. John's. This team started out this season at one and four. Right now they sit at two and four. The past few years, the Johnnies started losing their battles of New York with Manhattan College, clearly a no-no for the proud St. John's program. They started losing at Alumni Hall, and the bottom line for me is that Mike Jarvis didn't get the homegrown talent to stay here in New York. Sure, he landed Omar Cook, but then got burned when the Christ the King star left 
for an ill-advised attempt at the NBA. But what about the other New York City players that slipped through Jarvis's fingers? Julius Hodge out of St. Ray's went to North Carolina State. Alan Ray out of St. Ray's chose Villanova, as did Bishop Lachlan's Curtis Sumter. Zavarian's Chris Taft, last year's New York State Player of the Year, is now averaging nine points a game as a freshman at Pitt. And Pitt's leading scorer this year is Carl Krauser out of the Bronx. As for the players from the area that Jarvis lost out on, how about Amityville's Jason Frazier? He went to Villanova. And UConn's Ben Gordon, one of the best guards in the country, played at Mount Vernon. The point is, Mike Jarvis has garnered a reputation of a coach who has not embraced high school and AAU coaches in and around the city. And if you're going to succeed at St. John's, you have to be able to keep some of the top players here at home. We'll see if the next head coach, whomever that may be, will do just that. And there are plenty of names out there. If the season until Mike Jarvis was to A red storm at the Garden where the Johnnies were pouring on the three-pointers. Ten threes in the game led by Elijah Ingram, who hit five of them in the first half. He had 21 points in the game. St. John's dominated from the on the arc, but one Bruin put on a show in the paint. Trevor Ariza, back-to-back -back dunks. Nice for Ariza, but it was Ingram and the red storm blowing away the Bruins 71-55 to snap their first seven-game losing streak in 85 years. Been a long time. Over in Piscataway, the Scarlet Knights. Six of defense that propelled the Red Storm. 28-22, St. John's at intermission. A terrible shot by the Johnnies. Put Bowman in high gear once again, and Georgetown had dwindled the lead down to two. On defense, Bowman comes up with the block, then runs the floor, four-on-one break, ending with Bowman slamming down the alley-oop. St. John's weathered that storm, regained the lead. Curtis Johnson gave them a four-point bulge. Put a little baby jump hook for the big seven-footer. Off a Hoya turnover, Andre Stanley makes it a six-point game for St. John's. Hoya's a little bit rattled, call a timeout. So what happened after the T.O.? They turned it away again. Stanley to Darrell Hill and St. John's in front by eight. Hill began this season with the nickname Showtime. Well, he looks sort of like that on this play going in the lane. Hill was the thrill down the stretch. His three cinched it for St. John's, giving coach Kevin Clark his first Big East win since taking over for Mike Jarvis. And as the clock ran out, boy, did St. John's earn this celebration. What a victory. I thought that there would be no way that that patchwork team could win a game the rest of the way. Louis Karnaseka's guys did it. The Red Storm in a major upset over Georgetown. On the St. John's score, board 65-58 is the final. Hill with uh, 22 on 7 for 16 shooting. Stanley with 13 and 9 rebounds. St. John's first win in the Big East this year. And that, my friends, is indeed a major upset. Phil Martelli brought his undefeated St. Joe's. A long lineage of stars and great moments. Now there is scandal and excess, problems beyond wins and losses, what the president of this Catholic school calls the culture surrounding the basketball program. Earlier this month in Pittsburgh, several St. John's players were accused of raping a woman they had met in a strip club. The assault charges proved false, but the players did admit offering to pay the woman for sex. The fallout, Rachel Nichols reports, has crippled the program, making St. John's an outcast in its hometown. <laughs> St. John's in the 80s was the Yankees of, you know, the late 90s and, and, you know, early 2000. I mean, you know, the hottest ticket, I think, in the last 25 years at Madison Square Garden was the Georgetown St. John Showdown. That was then. This is now. In the wake of last week's sex scandal, the St. John's basketball team is down to eight players. She claims she was raped. Called a pattern of unacceptable behavior. I bet it's a sad time, not just for me, it's a sad time for everyone at St. John's. It's a sad time for the student athletes involved. I actually think it's a sad day, not just for our alums and friends, but New York City, because New York has so embraced and adopted St. John's. This is what rock bottom looks like. There is a whole heap of losing. There are a whole bunch of headlines about criminal behavior. The university's embarrassed by the program. They became the first 
program in Big East history to fire a coach in the middle of the season. Everything is bad right now. Six players were suspended or expelled after the incident in Pittsburgh. Freshman Tyler Jones is the only one back in uniform and one of only five scholarship players left on the team. Did you know that there was a curfew that night? Yeah, yeah, we all, everyone was aware of the curfew. And we just didn't think we were gonna get in trouble, I guess. Well, what are you guys thinking about? We were basically just having a good time, I guess. You know, people, people always sometimes tend to think they're invincible, like they're above the law or whatever, but this is a prime example that is not, not true. What has developed here is a, a pattern of criminality in the program. Mike Jarvis is the guy who brought these players here who ultimately committed these transgressions. But there's more. You know, ultimately, President Harrington has to take some responsibility. I really don't know what went wrong, uh, except one thing is very, very clear. These student athletes made terrible decisions. School President Donald Harrington was so worried about the damage done by those bad decisions that a few weeks ago he said he'd disband the team if it continued to muddy the school's reputation. I doubt seriously that they would consider dropping college basketball at St. John's because it's interwoven into the fabric of the New York City landscape. Hard to imagine an empty Madison Square Garden with uh, the red storm not running up and down. And yet the red storm will not be on the garden floor in mid-March. They will miss the Big East tournament for the first time in school history. What you have to understand about St. John's and the decline of this program is that it is based in the fact that the, the basketball program stopped connecting with the basketball community in New York City. At one time, St. John's had both sides of the river, plus the island over there, too. And uh, they, they kind of lost that, you know, and uh, they, they lost a lot of their contacts. Bob Oliva has coached nine players who've made it to the NBA, so he's seen plenty of recruiters come and go. But under former head coach Mike Jarvis, he saw St. John's rely more and more on junior college players. Interim coach Kevin Clark says the JUCO strategy was born more out of necessity than preference. We've gone through a lot of different things in terms of recruiting as well. I mean, we lost Ron Artest early to the NBA. We lost Eric Barkley early to the NBA. We lost Omar Cook early to the NBA. Darius Miles never made it to our campus. Um, so recruiting strategies had to change constantly. That argument doesn't wash with everyone. Everybody shouldn't go to St. John's. I mean, you know, but if there's a, if there's a top-notch player in, in, in the city, a, a, a guy like Julius Hodge who's down in North Carolina State, there was no reason why that he shouldn't have at least been recruited to go there. In order for them to get good high school players, you know, you just gotta really, you got to really go to the games. You got to really... You really just got to be there and talk to the high school coaches and uh, kind of rub their back, you know? It's important for the coach at St. John's to reach out and make those connections with the coach, with the player, with his parents, uh, in order to keep him home. But recruiting style isn't the only factor in drawing players. St. John's facilities are among the worst in the Big East, and the travel budget is extremely tight. The results have shown on the floor as the team is likely to finish with its worst record since 1919. The only good thing that can come out of something like this, I think it's made the administration take a hard look at the basketball program, at what they need to be successful in the basketball program. If you want to walk in the tall grass with the big cats, okay, you got to be prepared to fight like the big cats. You got to charter, you got to have great support staff. St. John's just hit a major, they didn't hit a bump in the road, they, 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 they hit a hole in the road, they, they, the whole vehicle went in the hole. and. Uh... It can only go one way. When you're down this far, you can only go up. And they will. Rachel Nichols reporting. Interim head coach Kevin Clark, an assistant under Mike Jarvis, received an endorsement from school president Father Donald Harrington as far as not contributing to what he called the culture around the program that created these problems. Father Harrington says the next Red Storm coach will be consistent with the values of St. John's University. So tonight, who will be... He thought it would never bring him home, but today it has. And now Roberts is facing the most daunting task of his career, turning around the St. John's program. The 38-year-old Kansas assistant was introduced today as the new head basketball coach for the Red Storm. His only other head coaching experience came at his alma mater, Queens College, from 1992 to 1995. But for Roberts, coming home is what it's all about. I only dreamed of coaching at one place. When you're in New York City... There's no other place to dream about, and that's St. John's. Nah, it doesn't matter if it's Carolina, Duke. It doesn't come close.
to St. John's. And I think you're getting another coach that has a raspy voice like Coach had. And, and uh, hopefully I can be just close to what Coach Conaseca has done. Baseball today, Matt Ooh. made of Norm Roberts. John feels good about his only head coaching experience, Queens College. His record there, 60 games under 500. Yet Norm Roberts is entrusted with the task of restoring a once big-time basketball program on Union Turnpike. Make no mistake, this will be a daunting task. A 38-year-old taking over a team that by season's end had just four scholarship players on the floor. Having served Bill Self as an assistant for eight years, including this past season at Kansas, the one-time assistant to Jack Curran at Archbishop Malloy comes home to Queens as the Johnnies roll out the red carpet. Fooch would roll into Jamaica, awaiting the coach with New York roots looking now to rebuild. I think I can bring it together with the high school coaches. I think I can bring it together with, with the AAU coaches. I think I can bring it together with the whole community. I, I think people would want to help St. John's. I hope people would want to help me because I'm from here. I think you know if a guy's going to coach at St. John's, he might as well be from here. And, and I think those are the things that can give me, hopefully, an advantage. He definitely got my attention. We focused more on him and on the other candidates and on the other candidates and just did a lot, a lot of checks, uh, especially since he was not currently a head coach that was an important question to ask as far as experience is he ready etc and having done that as well as having talked a lot about the others i came to the conclusion that norm was the man who had the who was ready and uh, hopefully could unify uh, many of our wonderful supporters out there. He's going to bring a wonderful blend of what it takes to be competitive nationally and what it takes to be competitively locally. And we're going to uh, infuse that into St. John's, and I think things are going to be uh, great in the future. My vision is to win a national championship. My, my vision is to win the Big East. Uh, you know, I, I told our players that are here right now, I said, hey, guys, no one's going to put more pressure on themselves than we're going to put on ourselves. You know, so don't worry about the outside people. I said the bottom line is we got to be consistent we got to be tough. We got to do things the right way, and good things will happen. It's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Just listen to him talk. He's going to be very strong, very intent. He's going to work. And those are the those are the products that make a successful coach. And don't forget the five percent luck. You're going to be a little lucky too. Growing up, nothing was handed to me, and I think that's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I got my mom and dad here, and my brothers. They're all New York guys. Um. <laughs> Norm gets emotional at the end. Matt Doherty never received an offer. Bobby Gonzalez never got to interview for this job. John, what do you think? You get the feeling that perhaps what happened at the end of his regime in North Carolina is why Matt Doherty didn't get this job ultimately. He had some turmoil there with his team. Certainly not something St. John's could want. I think in Bobby Gonzalez's case, his public face might have just been a tiny bit too much for St. John's. And plus, you throw in the fact of Fran Fraschilla's problems, and he was a former Manhattan coach. That probably weighed there. In this case, I think it's a good pick because Norm Roberts is from New York, and St. John's has to learn how to keep New Yorkers in town. And it's going to help that he's from New York. It doesn't guarantee success, but it certainly gives him a, lay a leg up knowing the lay of the land in this area. Funny, Luke Karnaseka coached at St. John's for 24 seasons. Since his retirement, the job has had little to no staying power. Let's look at how it's unfolded. Louis assistant Brian Mahoney, of course, recruited Felipe Lopez, but posted losing records in three of his final four seasons. The program was able to bounce back. But Manhattan transfer Fran Fraschilla lasted just two years. His motivational techniques were brought into question, as was his reported desire to seek a coaching gig elsewhere. Using players that Fraschilla had recruited, most notably Ron Artest and Eric Barkley, it's Mike Jarvis who got St. John's to the Elite Eight back in 1999. Four years later, in December of 2003, it's Jarvis who became the first head coach in the 25-year history of the Big East, remarkably, to be fired in midseason. And the job for Norm Roberts pretty much began after his introductory press conference meeting with some of the parents of the kids who will be brought back and basically convincing them everybody on the right page this program will move forward after several embarrassing episodes last year most notably the one in Pittsburgh yeah and the embarrassing part is really what it's all about it's restoring first of all the face of St. John's and then restoring what goes on on the basketball court and you look at the fact that they had only six wins last year and were an embarrassment on the court it's what happened away from the court that made this search so important and why Norm Roberts became such a viable candidate. Now, clearly, the reward that St. John's is seeking uh, for hiring Roberts does carry some risk. 
Let's take a look. He becomes just the third coach to be hired in the conference without any Division I head coaching experience or assistant apprenticeship in the Big East. The other two, Tommy Amaker, who took Seton Hall to the Sweet 16 in the third of his four years in New Jersey, and the aforementioned Matt Doherty, who's won an only year at Notre Dame, resulted in a loss at the NIT Finals. We've got plenty more to come on Sports Desk. We will check in with the Knicks. Tournament last week, the Johnny's baseball team found itself in that position so familiar to its basketball brethren, waiting out the NCAA selection show, which reveals the good news for the Red Storm, that it's been placed as a number three seed in the Palo Alto Regional. Oh, I love the ping. Where it opens the <laughs> tournament Friday versus Long Beach State, the 18th ranked team in the country. After a final practice on the campus in Queens, it was off to the West Coast. The field begins with 64. The final group goes to the College World Series. Regardless for St. John's, it's first NCAA regional baseball appearance since 1997, and Fooch was there for the send-off. It's been a long four years, and uh, it's well worth the wait, I'll tell you that much. It's, uh, we played in the tournament last week, and we're going out this week, and I can't tell you, we've come so close a couple times over the four years, so. It's a great feeling. This year has been an entirely different year. I've been here all four years, and we really put a lot more time and effort into this season as far as preparation and getting the team ready. So it worked out for the best for us. It's fabulous, and, uh, you know, I have to credit the kids. It's a team all year. We worked hard, and, uh, you know, we, we got what we deserved. We really did. It's just a great feeling, and uh, these kids earned it, played hard, uh, earned their way into an at-large bid, which is very tough to do in the Northeast, as you well know. Coach always says, you know, don't worry, really worry about uh, your opponent. Worry about yourself. Um, they can overlook us, you know, they can look past us all they want, that's fine, they're still going to have to play us, and we're going to have to play them, we're going to have to go through them to try to beat them, so. Well, I mean, we've prepared all year for, for a big game like this, and I'm sure our guys will, will be ready. Um, we faced quality pitching all year, and first round we're out of Boston College, faced him this year, a couple other top draft picks, so I mean, I'm sure we'll be ready. No doubt an alum, lefty reliever for the Mets, will be watching closely. <laughs> Much more still to come on Sports Desk. What does Herman Edwards think? Welcome back to the MSG Sports Desk. The word legend is so often overused in our society, but the man to my left truly is a legend in basketball and in New York. Lou Karnaseka, great to see you as always. Thank you, Joe, for those kind, kind words. You are very welcome, and it's Be careful true. I use the word legend. <laughs> I think we're safe with you, though. Lou is here, of course, as part of a great ceremony that's going to take place Tuesday night at Alumni Hall, the unveiling of the Lou Karnaseka Court. What is that like for you to know oh. that from now and forever, when people play at Alumni Hall, they'll well, be playing on a court? With your you had great players. Yeah. That's the first thing. I think it's it's a great feeling. I, uh, to think of all the great players, the great coaches that ever came there, and to be included and be remembered in that way is just a wonderful feeling. I just wish mom and dad yeah. were alive. I know everybody always wants to know when you have that many memories over that many seasons what are the one or two that stand out what are the things you think of when you think back on your time well, at I, I, first we think back of all the players you can't think of individually but just think of all the players all the great coaches that came there that preceded me like coach Lapchik, the guys that hoped like bernie savage and then of course you think about all the great players and rick barry's and jojo whites and of course the big east players you know there's so many memories, so many fine things. By the way, that was a tough court to play on. People hated to play there, right. really. You took a jump shot, and you can remember that. Maybe if you remember, remember the ball would bounce, it would come down for a week. Right. And let me tell you something. We had referees, and some of those referees in those days, you could sometimes request from those who were, <laughs> some we say a little partial or uh -huh. provincial, but those guys, you could beat the Chicago Bulls with the, with the war, with the, Jordan, you can beat him, I swear. <laughs> so there's some wonderful memories, and it's, uh, it's great. To do be you, able do to you sometimes wish that that building had as much of an aura as it did when you coached there? Because now well, it seems like they bring the, the bigger games for St. John's into this building, well, and it's much course, larger. Uh, you have to remember, the big games you always played in the garden, but a lot of those games were played at, uh, at Alumni Hall. But uh, there was something about that court. You were right into it. You know, you looked like... You were in the Colosseum in Rome right. at the time of the, you know, the way the olden days. It was, uh, it was a tough place to play, and uh, the fans were great. They were really great. What are you going to tell them on Tuesday night? I'm going to thank them, number one, for their loyal support, and they were supportive in good and bad. Uh, I wish that the new coach will have the success that we've had, and from what I've seen, I think he's going to do fine. I like what I see. I saw the. The Wagner game, and I see that 
His offense is very structured. His defense is very good. So I think things are looking bright. Yeah, time, yeah. To, time to turn the corner on the program well, for sure. Think, what have I you just, seen from Norm? I think it's uh, just have to be a little patient. You, know, you can't do it overnight. But I like what I see, and that's the best way I can put it. What is, uh, what is going to be your thought process as you have not only this great ceremony, but two months from now you turn 80, which is a pretty <laughs> huge uh, landmark in your life. First of all, thank God I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And number two, it's good to look back and think of all the wonderful relations I, I've made while well at St. John's. I'm not only talking with the players, but the wonderful people that worked there, the good Vincentian fathers, uh, and they were good. Really, they were very good. Uh, they gave me a shot, you know, in the old days. And there's some thoughts that you, you're going to take with you all. And naturally, it's going to come back to the court. Because when you look at I spent one third of my life on that court in the court, the laboratories. Right. And there were some unpleasant ones too, but the majority were very, very pleasant. But I still say, if you were to go into a closet right now and put on one of those sweaters from 25 <laughs> years ago, you'd look exactly <laughs> well, the same. Well, what do you do to, to, to well, remain so young? That's in the jeans. Uh -huh. A lot of people say because of my background, it's either the olive oil or the good wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can detest to that. <laughs> but on the topic of the sweaters, where did that whole thing begin? Well, let me tell you what. It was given to me by an Italian coach, the Italian woman's Olympic coach. And I got these two sweaters and just threw them in the closet. Forgot about them. It's now, February, it's now the beginning of January. And we had to go out and play Pittsburgh. And Mary says to me, Lou, it's you know, rather drafty. Why don't you grab a sweater? So I grabbed this. Sweat and food in my bag. I went out there. All of a sudden, I put it on. And when they put it on, the kid says, Coach, where'd you get that thing? It was a combination of colors, mm -hmm. of diagrams. You couldn't believe what it was, right? Lord and behold, Chris Mullen hits a jump shot at the buzzer. Then I had to wear it. If I didn't put on Coach, where's your sweater? Where's your sweater? Now, there were some very nice things about that sweater, but how would you like to be known as the guy who won games with a sweater? Right. It wasn't my coaching. Right. It wasn't my technique. It wasn't my, my uh, know-how. Mm -hmm. The sweater won all the games. 526 <laughs> wins, and now you're known as the guy with but the sweater. But it didn't take any blame for the losses. Right. Uh, never does. <laughs> how many, where are those sweaters now, and how many did you get over well, the Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I have I've received from all over the world, now from Ireland, Italy, South America, at least 150. Wow. And the, the original one, is up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Now that wasn't, you know, that'd be not a hurdy guy. You got him before I did. How about the one John Thompson wore? Oh, is I imitation let, sincere? Let me flattery, tell you right? what. <laughs> you know, I didn't mind the sweater, but really, it was when he beat me that really hurt. <laughs> but it was a, you know, it was, it was a fun time. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how a little thing like that caught on, and people related. Today, if I meet ten people. Eight people will ask me, like, just like right. you, where's the sweater? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the first thing that comes out of it. I think that's why I asked you, you know what? somebody told me to. We blew it. Mm -hmm. We could have merchandised the yeah. sweater. We could have made so much money. <laughs> True. It was fun times. <laughs> I want to ask you about something that's not so much fun right now. Yes. What's gone on uh, over the last few days in the NBA, sp specifically with Ron Artest, who came out of the St. John's program. Well, Your take on what occurred. You know, all of us have families. All of us are going to have children. And sometimes things happen which are not pleasant. But I don't think we can abandon it. I mean, true, he's going to receive his punishment. The thing, the die has been cast. But the biggest thing is, what are we going to do now? Are we going to help this individual? He still has a life to live. Now, he's got to do it himself. But are the conditions going to be favorable enough to him to come back and be able to stay there? Because everybody's knocking him down. So it's easy. When a guy's down, whack him. But if he can come back from this, if we can give him the help, I think I'll, things will be fine. What do you do, though, Lou? Because he's been helped so many times. But maybe he needs a little more. Uh, maybe was there enough effort? I'm not second-guessing uh, anybody. But maybe he needs a little hiatus from playing. And maybe he needs a little more care, a little more treatment to make him understand that this is what he has to do. Or else something more, maybe more traffic will happen. And we want to try to help this young man. He's a, he's a young man in the 20s, God, his whole life. Spoken like somebody who's spent a lot of time around a lot of young kids in his well, life. Do you ever wish that you can get back on the sidelines or in a practice court for even a couple minutes? Well, yeah, yeah, honestly, I, I did my thing and I was happy with it. But it's very obvious why I left. I think I left with a good taste. And that's something not many guys can say. 
And more important, I got burnt out. It just wasn't there. The fire went out. But I enjoy going to the games. I love to see these kids play. As I said to you, I think we're going to come back.